nearly 40 years, this diminutive rider was the biggest rider in thoroughbred racing. His name was Johnny Longdon. Johnny Longdon began his career in 1927 at the age of 20 and ran his final race in 1966 at the grand old age of 59. Longdon was a truly dedicated rider. And on one occasion, he brought home three winners in three different countries on two continents in less than a week. While riding for the Wheatley Stables in New York during the 1930s, Longdon rode to the top of his game. He is seen here riding Melodist to a victory in the 1937 Wood Memorial. This is that clubhouse turn with the lead, while the favorite three to five Pavian is well back in the pack at this point of the race. As they turn into the stretch, Sir Damien is shortening stride just a wee bit as Johnny Longdon takes his mount Melodist to the outside. And along the inside, Jewel Dorson is saving ground. But you can clearly see right now it's a two-horse race to the wire. Sir Damien on the inside, Melodist on the outside. Longdon not to be denied. He wins the wood drawing clear with Melodist at 15-1. In 1938, Johnny won 236 races, earned $235,000 in purses, and became the nation's number one jockey. In one 10 day span in 1939, Longdon won 21 out of 34 races at Chicago's Arlington Park. Perhaps the most memorable season of Johnny Longdon's career was in 1943. That year, he rode a horse called Count Fleet. Entering the Kentucky Derby, Longdon was hoping for his first win in racing's premier event. They're off for the 69th Derby, and Teddy Atkinson takes Gold Chow right to the front, while Johnny Longdon, laying between horses, moves up alongside to make a challenge as they swing into that clubhouse turn. Down the back stretch, Gold Shower still has a slight lead, but Longdon has Count Fleet flying on the outside and quickly takes over command. As they thunder into the stretch, Count Fleet has only one horse really to beat. That's Blue Swords, and you can see Blue Swords isn't going to catch Count Fleet. Longdon... Count Fleet not only provided him with a win in the Derby, but he also went on to win the Freakness and the Elmont Stakes. Longdon and Count Fleet were triple crown champions. Longdon went on to win over 300 races in 1947 and 48, as well as two national riding championships. Another memorable chapter in the Longdon legend took place in the early 1950s. Riding an Irish bred giant called Noor, Longdon defeated the Great Citation four times and set three world records in the process. In 1956, he closed in on Sir Gordon Richard's all-time record of 4,870 victories. On Labor Day 1956, Johnny tied the record and on the same day broke the record aboard a horse called Arrowgate. That year also turned out to be one of the most successful ones in Longdon's career as he won 320 races. Although he was inducted into the Horse Racing Hall of Fame that year, Johnny still had plenty of races ahead of him. In 1957, he reached win number 5,000. And in 1965, the man called Grandpa John won race number 6,000 in his native Canada. Entering the 1966 racing season, Longdon decided to retire following the San Juan Capistrano at Santa Anita. Riding a long shot named George Royal, the 59-year-old Marvel capped off his storybook career in dramatic fashion. Here comes Longdon and George Royal on the outside. Johnny's last race. He wants to go out a winner. It's George Royal on the outside, black on the inside, and with a late rush, here comes C.B. Whitney's Tomcat. The two horses are head and head, nose and nose. It's going to be a tight finish. It's going to be anybody's race. Here's the finish. Oh, it's too close. He brought his horse from behind, down the stretch, to win in a photo finish. Longdon finished with 6,032 wins and over $24 million in earnings. One jockey who dominated racing from the 1930s through the 50s was Eddie Arcaro. Eddie began riding horses in 1930, and before long, he was considered one of the best jockeys in the country. The first major accomplishment of his career was a victory in the 1938 Kentucky Derby. Then in 1941, Eddie Arcaro rode a horse called Whirl Away and made a run at the supreme award in racing, the Triple Crown. Disposed, battling with Porter's Cap and Starator 
is also making up ground, but Whirl Away is fourth on the outside and flying at the top of the stretch with about an eighth of a mile to go. Arcaro and Whirl Away go head and head for the lead and through the stretch, Arcaro has the lead. He's widening by three, by four, by five. It's going to be a handy score in the 67th Kentucky Derby for Eddie Arcaro and the great Whirl Away. With a derby win in hand, Arcaro and Whirl Away went after the Preakness. Arcaro widening, leading now by some six lengths, coming to the eighth pole. And with a furlong to run, the 1941 Preakness is in the lap of Eddie Arcaro, the great rider and the great champion, Whirl Away. All that remained in the Triple Crown quest was a victory in the final race, the Belmont Stakes. It's the triple crown for Arcaro and Whirl Away. Seven years after the triple crown season, Arcaro rode the great citation into the record books. It's a two-horse race to the wire, but it suddenly becomes a one-horse race to the wire as Citation passes stablemate Cole Town, and Eddie Arcaro has won the 1948 Kentucky Derby with a great Citation. They're off in the 1948 Preakness, and Eddie Arcaro rushes Citation right to the front. And down the back stretch, it's Citation leading by two lengths. Falcons Forge is second, Bobar third, and Better Self is fourth at the top of the stretch. Citation begins to widen on the field, and Eddie Arcaro has won the Preakness in 1948 with Citation. Citation and Arcaro at the top of the stretch, and through the stretch, it's an easy score. The 19. his two triple crowns, Eddie Arcaro won a total of 4,779 races. Arcaro rode 10 Horse of the Year winners and won 17 triple crown events. Eddie Arcaro retired in 1961 after 31 years of racing and is a member of the Horse Racing Hall of Fame. Without question, Willie Shoemaker is the greatest jockey in horse racing history. The Shoe is the all-time leader in career victories with nearly 9,000. He may never be cut. Following his first win in 1949, Shoemaker went on to become California's leading jockey for 17 consecutive seasons. At the 1955 Kentucky Derby, Shoemaker and Swaps battled Eddie Arcaro and the favored Nashua. Shoemaker has Swaps in front by three parts of a length. Nashua is laying third. Now as they swing for home, the long stretch run in the Derby, it's Swaps and Nashua. The fans can see it's a two-horse race. And Willie Shoemaker is pumping away with the right hand on Swaps. Nashua and Eddie Arcaro closing in. It's going to be a tight finish, but Swaps and Shoemaker still have the lead as they near the finish line. And it's going to be Swaps, an upset over Nashua. Here is Shoemaker taking the game Swaps to victory by a clear length and a half. In 1959, Shoemaker rode a horse called Tommy Lee in the Kentucky Derby, and once again, it was an exciting finish. They're head and head, nose and nose. First, it's Bowen on the outside, Shoemaker on the inside. The 1959 Kentucky Derby is going to be a tight photo, I'm sure of that. Here it is on the outside. It's still sore dancer by a neck. Shoemaker refuses to give up on Tommy Lee. He's battling back. It's going to take a close photo to split him. Here's the finish. Call it Tommy Lee by a nose. Sword dancer and Bowen. Willie Shoemaker won his first Belmont Stakes race in 1957 aboard Gallant Man. In 1962, Willie won his second Belmont while riding Jiper. On the lead with Shoemaker between horses and Jiper challenging. On the rail, Admiral Voyage in between horses and Jiper. Now it's a two-horse race to the wire. It's going to be tight. Admiral Voyage and Jiper head and head, nose and nose. Oh, it's a close photo. It's going to take the magic of the photo finish camera to split him. And the winner, after a long delay, is Jiper and Bill Shoemaker. In all, Shoemaker has won the Belmont five times. In addition to his success in the Belmont, he has won the Preakness two times. In 1965, Willie won his third Kentucky Derby. In 1970, Willie Shoemaker surpassed the all-time career win record held by Johnny Longden. During his career, Willie has led the nation's jockeys in earnings 10 times. He has ridden such fabled horses as Swaps, Tommy Lee, Cold Town, Sword Dancer, Jiper, Kelso, Northern Dancer, Forgo, Spectacular Bid, and John Henry.
1986, the 54-year-old Marvel rode a long shot named Ferdinand to a shocking win in the Kentucky Derby. It was his fourth win in racing's premier event. In California, Shoemaker has won the Santa Anita handicap a total of nine times. In a career that has spanned five decades, Shoemaker has earned over $117 million in persons. Along with all the records, all the victories, and all of the money, Willie Shoemaker has also earned a place in the hearts of racing fans all over the world. He is a rider who possesses the softest, steadiest pair of hands ever to hold the reins. Willie Shoemaker is a living legend who continues to increase his endless list of achievements with every race. Willie Shoemaker, the littlest giant in sports history. Puerto Rico's Angel Cordero broke into racing in 1965 and quickly made a name for himself by becoming New York's leading rider from 1967 to 1969. In 1967, he broke the state record for wins, and in 1968, his 354 victories made him the top rider in North America. During the 70s, Cordero built a reputation as one rider who would do anything to win. In the 1974 running of the Kentucky Derby, and El Cordero established himself as a truly exceptional rider while aboard Cannonade. William Two, agitated his third, followed by Destroyer. Next in line, J.R.'s pet, and Little Curran starts to make up ground. But passing the eighth pole, it's Cannonade still in front, widening by about two and a half lengths. Hudson County is second with Agitate third. But the 100th running of the Kentucky Derby goes to Cannonade and Angel Cordero Jr. with Hudson County. Cordero returned to the Kentucky Derby in 1976 and rode a horse called Bold Forbes. The race held special significance for Cordero since his horse was owned by a fellow Puerto Rican who had given Angel his first prize. The race boiled down to a duel between Bold Forbes and the favorite, Honest Pleasure. Following his second Derby win in 1976, Angel Cordero continued adding to his list of accomplishments. In 1981, he went over the $70 million mark in career earnings. Since then, he has gone on to win his second Freakness. In 1985, he won his third Kentucky Derby and is considered to be one of the finest jockeys ever to handle a horse. Lafitte Pincai Jr. is considered by many to be one of the greatest jockeys in recent history. Racing primarily in California, Pincai began winning races in 1966. He virtually dominated racing between 1970 and 1974. During that period, he won three Eclipse Awards as the most outstanding jockey. His success was so phenomenal that in 1975, the 28-year-old jockey was inducted into the Horse Racing Hall of Fame. One of Pinkai's greatest thrills came about in 1979 when he got the opportunity to ride Triple Crown winner up firm. It proved to be an unbeatable combination. Going out by four lengths. Up firm, he has the lead. Race by two and a half length. Coastal is now second. Zarovich third. It's a firm in front. After winning three straight races aboard a firm, Pinkai entered the Jockey Club Gold Cup and a much-awaited race with spectacular bid. The bid had won two legs of the Triple Crown that season. 
This race would also determine Horse of the Year honors. Cobb was given the fourth Eclipse Award of his career in 1979. One goal that still eluded Finkai was a victory in one of the Triple Crown events. In the 1982 Belmont Stakes, Lafitte was aboard Conquistador Cielo. In 1983, Lafitte returned to the Belmont and this time was riding Caveat. Looking for his first Kentucky Derby victory in 1984, Pinkai had all of his hopes riding on a horse called Swale. The crowd on the outside, here comes at the threshold. They're into the stretch. It's Swale in front by two. In the center of the track, fight over. On the outside, it's at the threshold. Coach Me Chad now takes fourth. Then it's life's magic on the extreme outside gate dancer with Valley Time. They're nearing the finish. It's all Swale. He's there by four. In 1985, Lafitte Pinkai Jr. became only the third rider ever to win 6,000 races as he took Doria's delight to a victory. Here's the line, five, five, and Lafitte Pinkai writes his way into the history books with win number 6,000, and it's Doria's delight. Later that year, he surpassed Johnny Longdon with win number 6,033 and is currently second to the immortal Willie Shoemaker on the all-time win list. One horse that enjoyed an incredible rags to riches career was a small ornery animal called John Henry. One of John Henry's most memorable traits was his dramatic style of coming from behind at the finish. Amazingly, John Henry was once sold for a mere $1,100. Once his trainer ran him on the grass turf, John Henry found his winning stride. He went on to become the richest horse of all time with a career total of $6.5 million in earnings. Unlike most ordinary horses, John Henry was able to run and win throughout a career that lasted eight years. He was known to horse racing fans everywhere as the old man. Straighten away in the stretch. The leader is Bold Traffic by four lengths. Golden Act is into second by one length. John Henry switches to the inside and now takes over second. Balzac on the far outside. John Henry is rolling by on top. In 1981, the six-year-old Wonder Horse ran in the world's richest race, the Arlington Million. Once again, John Henry came out of nowhere to win it in a photo finish. In 1984, John Henry put together some awesome figures. He finished in the money in 43 of 53 races. 
He won 30 of 49 races on the turf, and he set annual purse records two times. In all, he received five Eclipse Awards and was named Horse of the Year twice. running of the Arlington Minion, John Henry proved that at the age of nine, he was better than ever. Here they come spinning out of the turn. Royal Heron has a one length lead. Majinski's secret. John Henry, like gangbusters, followed by Goddardell Saul. Down the stretch of the eighth ball. John Henry, like a bullet. John Henry now taking command. Royal Heron got along the Rio in second. Majinski's secret is third. John Henry's career was the Valentine Handicap. Like all great performers, he went out with a crowd-pleasing victory. Four bases, John Henry out in the far outside, and he's five. And down the stretch they come. The old man, John Henry, takes command. Violet Coops for dinner on the inside, now charging up second. Win at the rail is third. Here they come to the finish, and here's John Henry in front. John Henry was a favorite among racing fans because he was the ultimate underdog. He possessed a common background in a royal sport, yet displayed the heart and courage that no amount of money could ever buy. In 1956, European racing bowed to the remarkable presence of the Italian horse Rebo. Side on the rails, Rebo coming on the right of the picture to challenge Todre. Kurun in fourth place, Chantelsi in fifth place, and Roy Star over on the right. And it's Highveld over on the far side. Rebo on the right. Rebo on the right, who's gone to the front now. Rebo taken it up by a length from Highveld. Todre's in third place, Kurun in fourth place, and it's Rebo, the Italian champion, this unbeaten horse, racing to the fourth victory in his 14th run of his career. Rebo had won his 14th straight victory and a prominent place among the great horses of history. While Park Top gathered admirers in her final season, a Canadian bred three year old, Najinsky, from Vincent O'Brien's stable, had run through the English and Irish classics unbeaten and unextended. His first confrontation with older horses came on the 25th of July at Ascot. Carabas, Hogarth in between these two. Najinsky's just in behind Carabas. Blakeney's over on the far rails. Trepalana's beginning a run. And it's Caliban over on the far side being pressed by Carabas. And here comes Najinsky and Lester Bigger towards the stand side with Hogarth making ground over on the far side. Now they're coming into the final furlong. And it's Najinsky striding away from him. Najinsky going away, being chased by Blakeney now. It's the two Derby winners who look like being first and second. Lester Bigger looks over his shoulder. Blakeney's making ground on him, but Lester's just letting him catch. What a horse this is, he's trotted up. Just... Behind him finished two Derby winners, as well as the winners of the Washington International, Coronation Cup and French Oaks. Piggott had never displayed such confidence, easing Najinsky half a furlong from the post. It was his fourth triumph in the King George from the last six runnings. of England celebrated in 1977. It was the Silver Jubilee, the 25th year of Queen Elizabeth II's reign. And, breaking with tradition, she arrived at Ascot's July meeting in an open carriage to see the race named in honor of her parents. There have been few more courageous winners of the Derby than the Minstrel. The year had so far provided Lester Piggott and the Minstrel's trainer, Vincent O'Brien, with an almost unbroken series of top races. After Epsom, they travelled to the Curra to win the Irish Derby and four weeks later to Ascot. A young John Gosden, assistant to O'Brien, helped Piggott into the saddle. Bruni, now five and attempting to improve on his second place the previous year, 
The Peter Warwin train crow in the same colours as the 1976 winner, Paul Nice. Excella and Baron Guy de Rothschild's recent French derby winner, Crystal Palace. Strong and attractive, but below medium height at only 15 two and a half hands, the minstrel had the look of his sire, Northern Dancer, who had first come to prominence with Nijinsky. Could the minstrel become his second winner of the diamonds? that away. Rafissimo on the inside. The minstrel starts a little bit slowly as the back marker and it's Rafissimo on the inside of Crystal Palace and Mart Lane. Mart Lane going on now from Crystal Palace and Rafissimo. Then comes Lucky Wednesday. Then Acceler on the inside of Trainer Seat and then Orange Bay. Then comes Bruni on the inside and now Norfolk Air has been relegated to last place and it's Mart Lane from Rafissimo and Crystal Palace and Lucky Wednesday. Then Acceler. Then Trainer Seat and Orange Bay. Bruni on the inside. The minstrel. And the back marker is Norfolk Air as they run down now into Swindley Bottom. Mart Lane from Lucky Wednesday and Rafissimo and Crystal Palace and Trainer's Seat. Acceler on the inside. Then comes Orange Bay. Just in behind Orange Bay, the minstrel has made a little bit of progress. Bruni's on the inside. Crow's on the outside of the minstrel. And Norfolk Air's the back marker. And now they're just coming up towards the seven furlong pole in the King George of the Six and Queen Elizabeth Diamond Stakes. And it's Mart Lane in the lead from Lucky Wednesday and Rafissimo and Trainer's Seat and then comes Crystal Palace then Orange Bay and Excella then Crow on the outside of Bruni then comes the Minstrel and last is Norfolk Air past the six marker now and Mark Lane taking him along at a tremendous pace from Lucky Wednesday in second Orange Bay is now going third Trainer's Seat is four five is Rafissimo six Crystal Palace then comes Bruni and Crow and then Excella then the Minstrel and Norfolk Air is last and they're passing the five marker now and it's still Mark Lane for Ireland from Lucky Wednesday in second third is Orange Bay then comes Rafissimo and Trainer's Seat then Bruni and Crystal Palace and Excella and the Minstrel making progress Crow is now the one of the back markers with Norfolk Air and they've just got three and a half furlongs to run now they're racing towards the home turn and it's still Mark Lane and Edward Hyde from Lucky Wednesday in second Orange Bay then comes Bruni behind Bruni is Trainer's Seat then the Minstrel making ground with Crystal Palace two and a half furlongs to run in the King George Six and Queen Elizabeth Diamond Stakes and it's Mark Lane being pressed by Orange Bay here comes the Minstrel unleashing a run towards the right of the picture with Bruni upside then Crystal Palace and Excella behind him they're racing towards the foul on pole now and it's Orange Bay who strikes the front. It's Orange Bay now from the Minstrel Excella putting in a great run towards the stand side. It's Orange Bay being tackled by the Minstrel and Excella and as they race into the closing stages it's the Minstrel from Orange Bay and Excella racing up towards the line. The Minstrel from Orange Bay and Excella but as they come to the line the Minstrel with the Minstrel, the Minstrel, the Minstrel. Excella is third and four Crystal Palace. Norfolk Air, Mark Lane and Lucky Wednesday and Bruni behind them, Trainer Seat and Crow and last Rafissimo. Officially it's a photo. Fitted with blinkers for the first time, Orange Bay had stayed on to the line. The crowd were undecided and rushed to see who returned as the winner. The minstrel had won, but only a short head separated them at the finish. Vincent O'Brown had trained the winner of the King George for the third time to equal the newly retired Sir Noel Merlis. Just three weeks after the King George, it was announced that a half share in the minstrel had been sold back to his breeder E.P. Taylor for $4,100,000. Four partners headed by Robert Sangster had bought the minstrel at America's Keeneland July sale two years before for $200,000. For Lester Piggott, it was his sixth King George. His nearest rivals, Poncelet, Paz and Saint-Martin, had ridden two each. In 1981, such was the reputation of Shergar, the record-breaking 10 lengths derby winner, that for the first time in the history of the King George, there was not a single overseas runner. For his jockey, Walter Swinburne, it was to be his first ride in the race. And that away. 
Shergar, Master Willie and Light Cavalry the first to show and Light Cavalry going on now from Master Willie and Shergar. Then comes Madame Gay, Pellerin on the inside, Fingal's Cave and finally Crackerbell. Light Cavalry making it from Master Willie and Shergar disputing second. Just behind them come Madame Gay, then Pellerin. Behind Pellerin is Fingal's Cave and finally Light Cavalry as they race downhill still towards Swinley Bottom. Light Cavalry not taking him along at a very fast gallop at the moment. From Master Willie on the outside of Shergar, then Pellerin and Madame Gay matching strides are behind them, Fingal's Cave, and finally Crackerbell. Racing towards the mile pole now in the King George VI and Queen Elizabeth Diamond Stakes, and it's Light Cavalry, Lester Bigot in the lead from Master Willie and Shergar, then Madame Gay and Pellerin, then Fingal's Cave, and finally Crackerbell. Racing towards the seven furlong pole and the pace has quickened and Light Cavalry still in the lead from Master Willie second. Shergar the three-year-old on the inside. Just behind them, Madame Gay the only filly. Then comes Pellerin. Behind Pellerin is Fingal's Cave and then comes Crackerbell. They've passed the seven marker, racing towards the six now and still Light Cavalry from Master Willie. Then Shergar, Madame Gay getting closer. Then Pellerin. Behind Pellerin, Fingal's Cave and finally Crackerbell. They pass the six furlong pole now, racing towards the five and it's Light Cavalry from Master Willie, Shergar, Madame Gay going up on the outside of Shergar, Pellerin comes next, Fingal's Cave and Crackerbell getting closer. Racing towards the half mile mark and as they do so, Master Willie goes up on the outside of Light Cavalry, Shergar on the inside, then Madame Gay, behind Madame Gay is Fingal's Cave, Pellerin is losing ground, then comes Crackerbell, they're racing towards the home turn and it's Master Willie and Light Cavalry, Master Willie going on now from Light Cavalry, Madame Gay's moved round on the outside of Shergar, Shergar in fourth place now now as they race towards the home turn. Crackerbell's improved into fifth and Master Willie going for home now. It's Master Willie with the advantage over Light Cavalry. Walter Swinburne slipped through on the rails on Shergar, but it's Master Willie with the advantage. Madame Gay coming there strongly on the stand side. Shergar making ground over on the far side now. Racing down towards the furlong pole and Shergar, the three-year-old, bursts through to take it up on the far side. It's Shergar now from Madame Gay. Master Willie fingers Cave putting it a good run, but as they race into the closing stages, Shergar lengthening in his stride, he's going to win it in tremendous style, Shergar striding up to the line from Madame Gay and Fingal's Cave and at the line, Shergar wins it, Madame Gay and Fingal's Cave in a photo for second and third then He had become the fifth horse after Nijinsky, Grundy, the Minstrel and Troy to win the English and Irish derbies and the King George His disappearance, 18 months later, remains unresolved Strength comes 